Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel today. Uh, what I'm going to do is once the camera stops wiggling is just spend some time to talk to you about my first play experience with a most fearful sacrifice. I got my first game in on Saturday and so the fire tutorial that I did, I did a combat tutorial and I did a movement tutorial and that knowledge really helped me form the basis of learning the game overall. I had read through the rules, but I'm the type of person where none of it really makes sense until you put the pieces out and you actually play, and I actually had room to set up the map and everything. So I want to go over that experience. Now, I only got to play one game, and I've only got to keep the game for about a week, and so I have to send it on to the next person. So this is a very kind of early formed opinions of the game. I'm sure that once the final game is out and everything, and had more time to play, then be able to form, uh, you know, maybe stronger opinions and whatnot. So this is really just kind of first impressions. All right, so first thing I want to share is the player aid cards. When I went to play at my buddy's house, I forgot them. I did not bring these. And so I called and had my wife take a picture of them with her phone and she sent me those in text and I shared that with my friend. So we were looking at these on our phones, uh, which got me thinking, wow, there needs to be an app for this. Because <laughs> if there was a nice app with nice, fully realized information that you need, um, in those hot moments when you can't, whatever, um, that'd be cool to have them as a backup on your phone. But the good news is, the thing is that made it challenging was the pictures on the phone were blurry. I know we probably could have had my wife scan them, send them as a PDF, and my buddy could have printed them out, but we weren't going to do all that. So we just ran them off our phone. They were blurry reading them that way off the phone. However, we were able to read enough that I, I think we, we got it figured out. The good news is, I wanted to share that story, is to let you know that the game is actually intuitive enough that with the limited access to the cards that we had, I think we played a pretty good game of a most fearful sacrifice. So that's, that's excellent. And it also lets you know that you can pretty much drive the game from the player aid cards once you have a good understanding of the rules. So these are just here to give you your necessary like combat charts. Uh, this is a beautiful sequence of play that I wish I had been able to read better and follow. So I just used the basic one in the rule book. But we were able to make the game work because it's really well written. So let me, let me set these aside now that I, I shared that story with you. And now we're going to talk about the rest of the components. So by now you've probably seen Mo's video where he did a nice component unboxing, showed you everything. So what I want to do is take that a step further and kind of walk through setting up the game and kind of playing it and how you would use those components. And just to share the fun drama of game design, I had mentioned to Herman Lutman that I'm not a fan of the butternut color. <laughs> so I was like, these uh, Confederate counters that are all this, you know, kind of puke brown, it, it's not attractive to me. And he was like, um, but historically, this is more in line with what they wore, that the gray is actually not historically, you know, they had gray, but not as predominant as you see like in movies and stuff. And so I was like, oh, because I would much rather see gray. Um, so who knows what will work into the final counters, what you'll get. I'm sure that might not seem like much to some folks, but I do know that there will probably be, um, you know, that might actually be a topic for people to discuss is what color should the Confederate counters be in a most fearful sacrifice. Now the thing is, the finals are, the files for the printer, they're like pretty much set. So I doubt that there's gonna be a whole lot of change to it. It's just something that kind of struck my mind as a new, to American Civil War gaming that I am one of those ones that's most used to and been brought up on the South War Gray. In fact, after this game, I didn't even know this brown was an option. That's how new I am to this debate. So take my thoughts with a grain of salt. You, you all discuss that amongst yourselves. So I'm going to set the lid aside. Okay. 
Now, I'm just going to grab, I'm going to grab, what I'm going to do, let's kind of start from the beginning here. Let me adjust some lighting a little bit. All right, so first thing you're going to do is you want to pick your scenario, right? That would make most sense. The game's got 13 scenarios, but here's what you need from the scenario. So first, there's the little, the little story. Uh, this one, scenario two, you will be coming around the mountain. Starts at 2 p.m. Each turn is an hour, and so it ends at the 5 p.m. turn. So this was a relatively short. You got two union. Well, I won't say two union turn. Everybody does something during the turn, but I'll explain what I mean by in a second. So you had like two union lead turns and two Confederate lead turns. Now I'm going to bring the camera down a little bit, try not to give you whiplash, but let's talk a little bit about what goes into a scenario. Now for me and the layout, I'm because I'm new, I don't quite understand like Von Gilsa. Just by looking at the setup, Von Gilsa tells me nothing. I don't know what core, division, anything like that. So I, if I could, I would move the union setup after you receive your uh, scenario cards because the scenario cards are going to tell you specifically which core activation cards to pull. So the way the game works is that when you want to activate a unit there's a card pull mechanic and as you pull the card that will let you know if that core activates. And so that's what I've got here are some bags. So first is your union setup and then the confederate setup. Then you got your uh, reinforcement schedule and your confederate reinforcement schedule. So you know what units are coming. Now for those who are really well versed in Civil War, this is probably no problem. You, you can go find these divisions real quickly in your setup. For me, it wasn't quite so easy. Um, then you get into the rules tells you what turn marker to put it on. Now this particular battle, the map, one thing that I would like is if on a player aid there was a separate turn tracker, we just kept track in our mind because the board, the uh, I guess it's the southern half of the map has the turn tracker and we only played on just the one map. So I kind of wish there was a separate turn tracker somewhere for those times you don't use the full map. All right, so we were started at 2 p.m. Then it says where you play, which map to play on, and what section that you're playing with. Got it. Lays out the borders. No problem. Perfect for when you get those border strips. Then this is the important part, the scenario cards. So the game works by a card draw mechanic to determine what activates or if there's any special events that occur. And this tells you how to start. So real easy. You get a Fog of War card or the Fortune of War card. I don't know if Fog of War is the name to go with. It's a fortune of war card that you pull. Then Howard is a Union Corps leader that you grab. So if I just take these out, these are just put back in the bag. I didn't prepare it for this, but essentially you would look through your stack of cards and my copy didn't have a fortune of war card. So we just simply used a friction of war card and then when we drew the friction of war we looked at the sample card in the in the uh, rule book and then we knew what to roll to get the Fortune of War card result. So you start by putting this in a draw pile. And then it said Howard. So what you got to do is at the top of each of these division and core cards, just find the ones assigned to you. So I'm going to find the blue ones. Now, what I was showing in the graphics is that with these cards, the core and the divisions associated with a core are color coded. The color coding has been cut off of these cards. So that was a thing I, I didn't even know was a thing, which would be nice to know because that would help you find the divisions. So for example, you can kind of barely see it here. I think there's a little bit of green on this card that probably should have been a thicker border. But um, that if, um, if Herman or somebody watches this, that might be a consideration to check on the card size because I think this as it is is a standard playing card size and so you might have to shrink the card in order for the border to fit and still maintain a standard playing card size. Oh, you know what? I lied. I sent an email saying that I didn't have Reynolds or Mead. I do. I didn't remember seeing them the first time. Alright, well anyway, I'm looking for... Who did I say? Howard. I had Howard. Well... I think I might have passed him. All right, but so what you'll do is I'm just going to pretend these are the guys. So let's say this was Howard. 
So it says you got your fog of war, you got your Howard, uh, then you needed to find the Confederate equivalent. Oh, that might be over here in this one. I got two bags of cards. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah, there it is. So you grab Yule, and that's going to go into the initial draw card pile. So there's your Fortunes of War, and then you got to have Howard. So I think Howard is in here. These are the cards we played with yesterday. Yep, there's Howard. And you drop in Howard. And then it says you're also going to have six Union event cards and six Confederate event cards. Okay, great. So your card starts off with these three. These are guaranteed to be pulled. So we're going to set those aside for just a moment. All right, you need that from the scenario. Now, also in the scenario, it mentions your Union Command display. And those I've got right here. Now I'm going to show these like this. I don't have enough table space to set this up, which is why I can't play it here. But here's how a command display works. When you draw, and let's say we draw Howard. Howard rolls, and he'll see which divisions that have been assigned to him are the ones that will potentially activate. And so that's what the scenario book here says. The scenario book says on the Union Command display, I'm going to have shirts and Barlow. So that was another thing. My copy of the game did not have shirts. So what I did was, oh, it looks like I got, oh, Barlow. Barlow is a division. So I got Barlow and shirts. I didn't have shirts, so I think I just grabbed a random guy like maybe Williams, we'll just say. Let's say I was assigned Williams. So what you'll do is on your command display card that you'll have on your table somewhere, you'll have these two divisions that you can assign. They can go in either spot. Um, I'll explain why that's important to know later, but when you start according to that scenario setup, I've got two division commanders at the core disposal. All right, so we're going to Set that aside. So these don't go into the draw pile. They stay here and you assign them first activation or second activation, depending on first activation comes up more often than second. So it's like, which one do I think is more important to use at this time? So let's set that aside. And Confederate player will do the same thing. Then it says to build the rest of your draw pile. Each side will get two key event cards and then four random event cards. All right, so here's your event cards. There's 15 event cards for each player. And what they're talking about is this. This is how you fill out the rest of that randomly drawn card pile. I'm going to look through and find two cards that I think I would like. And I'm going to say, yeah, I really want take those colors and I really want stand to it. Like I want these to appear in the turn because the rest of the cards that I put in are random. So we're going to say, boom, I've added those to the draw pile. That's what I want to come up. And then when we get to that part of the game, we would then fill in with four of our remaining event cards. We're going to draw four more and stick them in. And the Confederate player does the same thing. So when you first start this scenario, there's going to be 15 cards in the draw pile. So we're going to set this aside for a moment. Then we determine the preliminary bombardment phase. If you have multiple brigades of artillery, what you can do is in the preliminary bombardment phase, uh, one artillery brigade gets to fire for free. If you want to fire with more, you have to um, basically discard for this turn a event card. It'll, these come back in the next turn, but if I had, say, three artillery brigades and I want to shoot with all of them in the preliminary bombardment, I get one for free and pay for the next two. Then, later, when I create my draw pile for the turn, if I played two cards for that um, preliminary bombardment, then it said, you know how it said you got to get four more at random? You deduct the number of cards you spend for the preliminary bombardment from the amount of random cards you have to add to the draw deck, up to a maximum of four. In this particular scenario, there's only one artillery brigade per 
uh, Confederate and Union, so there's no need to discard cards for preliminary bombardment. It's in there because it's a rule, uh, but there are special rules in this case. So for example, like the Union player may not fire the, the Wheeler or Dil Dilger units during the first game's turn, but later you could during preliminary bombardment. Then it goes in to talk about um, there's a general casualty chart to use specifically with this scenario versus the default one. And then finally, talks about when the game ends and victory points. So some very key important pieces of information know, for this scenario. So once you've got that, boom, you can set that aside. Then we're going to just take this map. Now, I was so excited to talk to you guys about the game. I really didn't prepare for this. This is all off the cuff. But I kind of in a hurry a little bit because, again, I got to get this game in the mail off to the next person. So we're just going to set that down. Uh, and we're going to have a mini, mini portion of the map here for us to look at. All right. So at that point, really, you can start playing. So if we just lift this back up a little bit, so what you could do is right here is your handy dandy sequence of play. It is kind of small print. I have mentioned like what could we do to get bigger fonts, but then that would mean, you know, bigger font would mean more player aids, more cost. So I'm not quite sure what we'll do, but I know plenty of people will make their own custom play aids at some point. I planned on it, like putting this on its own separate sheet of paper and whatnot, just because it's so handy. So to start the game, we advance the game turn marker, which I mentioned is on one of the maps where you can set one off to your side. For the first turn of the game, you don't have to advance the marker because the game starts where it needs to be. Then there's the command decision phase. That's where you build your deck of cards. So the scenario initially started you on that process. So we have to include the core commanders as designated in the scenario, including reinforcements when they arrive. And this one said you in, um, add in that uh, Fortune of War card, but I substitute with the Friction of War until I get the actual card. So we start our draw pile with three. I had chosen my two cards, and then because I did not wish to do any additional preliminary bombardment, I would look at my remaining. Well, you don't look at them, you keep it secret. You don't even know what's coming out. And then I would just grab four more. One, two, three, four. And then the uh, Confederate player would do the same thing. So I'm just going to grab some cards. One, two, three, four, five, and six. And we'll say that's what the Confederate player play, picked up. So now we have our draw pile. This will dictate how the turn goes. Then the decision is like which two cards you want to keep. That's where some of that command decision comes in. So you shuffle it up. I know this is shuffled horribly. I never really could figure out a good way to shuffle just a handful of cards. I know you Magic the Gathering players and, and folks that play collectible card games probably have all kinds of tricks for shuffling, but I just kind of mix them up a little bit. All right, so now we've got it. Boom. Then you do the preliminary bombardment phase and I know, probably some people might not like this, but it starts with the Union player, unless the scenario dictates otherwise. So in the scenario that this says, the Union player doesn't fire certain units first, so it's like, okay. But normally, after you go past that first turn, you look at all your brigades on the map board, and, well, one brigade. You look at all your brigades and you choose one brigade, and then that brigade will be active to conduct a fire attack on somebody. Cool. It's like the free, you know, soften them up before we send in the troops. Uh, but if you had discarded cards, then what would happen is you and the Confederate player would alternate resolving the preliminary bombardments until all the cards have been resolved. And if only one player had cards remaining, they would just resolve the remaining brigades back to back. So after the preliminary bombardment is done, then comes the card draw. So now we've got that pile we made, and that means all the other cards we didn't put in here are just set off to the side, and when the next turn comes up, all the cards for the, the Union and Confederate player would be you know, shuffled together, and they would then go back to that process of picking two event cards and then taking four random ones. So we would just simply flip the first card. Boom. Now, 
the way the game says to play it is uh, on odd number turns, the Union player will draw the cards, and on the even number turns, the Confederate player draws the cards. And the other player doesn't see the card until the person drawing has had a chance to look at it. And in the rules, they explain that there was a, I forget the name, but like a spy. So basically, this is like your spy network, maybe getting a drop on what the other player is doing. So if I was a Union player, I would draw, and I'd go, oh, he got a, he drew, my opponent drew seeing the elephant, and you can read the event. Force any Union unit with a printed cohesion rating of one or two to roll or modified. The modified is irrelevant. Uh, that's within two X's of a rebel unit to roll a die. And this is like a morale thing. I haven't quite seen exactly where that quote comes from, but I've seen that in another war game. So I'd like to know where that came from. I should Google that, but the comment section is pretty powerful for me. So leave a comment if you know where that reference comes from and why they use it with morale. Anyway, um, your player looks at it and says, oh, okay, they drew that. And then they would hand it off to the opponent if it belongs to the opponent. Now, if this was a union card that I drew, I could look at it, keep it, but I wouldn't tell my opponent what I drew, right? It's secret for me. Now, this says play immediately. There are some cards, this is lucky, that say hold. So if it's play immediately, I draw it, look at it, hand it to my opponent if I need to, and then they play it. Now, if this did not apply to anything on the board, you don't have to play this for the listed event. Down here is something called a default event. I can use the card to issue a minimum move command to a unit, one unit, not a whole division or brigade, but one unit, or I can issue a fire combat. That is great because there will be times where you draw a card and the text is not pertinent. And then instead of feeling like you're just drawing wasted cards, I can still play it for a move or a fire action. And that's wonderful. And it doesn't matter if it's a play immediate or a hold. But here's the key. If you get a card that says hold, you get to keep that in your hand as long as you want. But if you don't play it for the default action, you can't wait like two turns later and say, you know what, this text no longer applies. I want to play it for the default event. So at the time that you draw the card, before you move on with your turn, you need to decide, am I holding it, playing the text, or using a default event? But let me just tell you, this was great. Because a lot of times, we found it just more useful to use a default event. And I asked uh, Herman Lemon about that, and I was like, yeah, we found it actually just more convenient to not even worry about the text. And he said, that's fine. Because what that means is, the event on the card is all the more special when you enact it. And that kind of made sense. So when you actually do play a card for the text and it really zings the opponent, that's the intent. Otherwise, this just gives you some more mobility and combat options with your units that you wouldn't have otherwise. So kudos on that card design. These are great. Uh, so that's what you would do. Draw the card, see if it's play or hold, give it to your opponent or keep it. Now, let's say you draw and you go back and forth. It might be a while before you do anything. Uh, when I played my buddy, he was like, but when do I get to do something? Well, you keep drawing, playing the cards or playing the actions until you draw one of those magical core commanders. All right, this is where the magic really starts to happen. So I'm gonna grab one of my special union dice. When you draw your core commander, what you're going to do is roll to see which of his divisions will activate. So you just simply roll a die six. Boom! I rolled a four. So I look at the three, four. It says I can activate one brigade from the division in division priority number one slot. And the Osborne Artillery. Yay! That's important because depending on how good your core commander is, you might actually be able to activate more than one division. But if you look at Howard, it says Howard of the 11th Corps was a poor commander. That wording in itself, I haven't seen um, take immediate mechanical results in the game, but it is certainly reflected in how many divisions he can activate. Uh, I forget who the core commander was for my buddy. That's in the draw pile here somewhere. But Ewell, 
If you look, Yule is an average commander, and if you roll a 6, he can activate the division cards in slot 1 and 2 and dance his artillery, which he didn't have dance artillery in a scenario that we played. But if you look at Howard, if I roll a 6, I just get to activate one division. All right, and that's where your display command chart comes in. When you're setting up your event cards in that decision-making process phase, you have to decide which priority slot you want your division commanders to be in. Now I know with Howard, since the best I can only ever activate is one division, I have to look at the board, look at the tactical situation, and decide, okay, at what point, you know, which of my two initial divisions are important that I activate. So I might look at the situation on the board and say, okay, Barlow's people are where I need them to be, so I'm going to keep that in Division Priority 1 slot. So with Howard and I rolled, it said I can activate one brigade from this division. Now, here's the second important part about that core card. You have some text that's in red. Now, the red means I have to follow that exactly. It says I can activate one brigade from Division Priority 1. Whereas if I rolled a 5, I could then activate the entire division. So the red overrides rolling on the division card. But if you've got a 5 or a 6, I can then look at my division uh, priority 1 slot, and then I roll a dice to see exactly how many brigades or if I can activate the whole division. So it's a chain of command that filters down. I like it because it's a very subtle way of simulating orders and couriers that are running out back and forth. The chain, of, the chain of command is there, but is the communication there between the chain of command? So I draw Howard, I rolled a four, so I only get to activate one brigade. But let's say I rolled a five. So if I find that union die again, so if I rolled a five and it says, okay, you get to roll on the division priority one card. So then I take a look at Barlow, Barlow's division, and I roll a die six. Boom. Well, I rolled a two. That means I could activate one brigade from Barlow's division. But again, the higher you roll, the better. Now, he's an average commander. So if I rolled, say, a five, I can do a division group. Or, because uh, there's, some of these divisions have um, multiple brigade groupings. So I might do one group out of division, or I can do, uh, like if I roll a six, I can do division by uh, each brigade. Like I would do the whole division. Now that part I might be a little foggy on because I got to play once. So there's a chance we may have misread that part, but that's essentially the gist. This is your chain of command when you draw that core commander card. Are you activating only, you know, depending on your role, are you activating only one brigade? So for example here, like if I rolled a one, I would activate one brigade. So I wouldn't even have to roll on my division, but I know I could activate one brigade from Barlow. And then I could activate one hex of Osborne artillery. That means the horse pony guys, they did not get the orders out. So that's probably one of the more important steps of the game is knowing exactly who you get to activate when you draw the core. And then, boom, they do their action and they're done the rest of the turn, essentially. Unless you pull and use these defaults. So this was a concept that wasn't really explained in the rules, but we kind of figured out on our own. These units can activate multiple times. So if I have out here, there, here's that brown color I was talking about, the butter, the butternut for the Confederate. So that's how I know these are the Confederates. See, I think they look snazzy with some gray counters, but uh, that's just my personal opinion. Yeah, I'm going for aesthetics, not historical accuracy, which is terrible when you're doing a historically accurate game. All right, so anyway, enough about colors. Um, you, when you activate, where was I going with this? Oh, there was a reason why I was bringing that out. Um, mm -hmm, my brain just had a moment. I activated a card. We were doing a unit activation. 
the core brigade you know what there was a thought and then gone oh yeah here it was it just came back I might edit that out I might leave it all right so this is very cool even though I might have my core activation and let's say I activate this brigade this brigade does an action that doesn't limit them from doing more there's no markers artillery does get a fired move but that that's a different thing but typically these units don't get marked with moved and fired markers since the turn is about an hour long that means as the turn goes on and I say oh here Eddie gets an event card for the Union player and I don't like the text but I want to do the default event I'm gonna fire with that artillery then we draw another card oh Union player again yeah I don't like the text I'm gonna use the default event and have this artillery fire again now at first in traditional sense of a game when a unit activates they're done so the thought of me having this unit fire six times seven times in a turn really kind of didn't make sense to me and so my buddy who's a Civil War reenactor I asked him I said well you know how long does it take for them to reload and fire a cannon And he was like maybe a couple of minutes you know I I can't remember exactly what he said but let's say it took three minutes to reload a cannon and if I played six firing cards on this cannon that's times three that's 18 minutes of firing and reloading if they were going maximum speed I'm sure you would get tired and it would slow down a turn is an hour long so for this cannon to fire six times within the limit of an hour probably is not unrealistic and because it's a battery or more that's not just one cannon firing it's like a group of cannons firing so my friend was like well so really how many times they fired in that turn doesn't matter except for one component we don't track and that's ammunition I didn't see an ammo rule I may have overlooked that so the only concern would be do you really want if you were tracking ammo to be that liberal and you did you know to fire that many times you're just gonna blow through your ammo that you brought so when I looked at it in that terms yeah this is an hour of time they can easily fire six times in an hour and the fact that nobody else is firing six times that could narratively I like to create narrative that could mean that they were conserving ammo maybe they had an ammo shortage again abstracted things that really aren't important what's important is that this brigade or you know uh, section of artillery this artillery unit said we're firing pour on the lead boys because their situational awareness on the field said they needed to fire so the way that these cards work to give actions that might not otherwise be there is great and what's nice is because in this scenario when you first start there's only one core that activates and if I roll poorly I might have brigades that don't do anything that turn they can now because of these cards it doesn't activate the whole brigade it activates one unit so if I had two more artillery I would still only pick one unit so I'm not getting to continually activate entire brigades but it doesn't mean all my units are useless throughout the turn if I roll poorly these cards help so it's a really wonderful synergy that they have between your command and control and how do I bring in unactivated units into the game brilliant and so thankful for it all right so you draw your card and we activated a unit so then we would do things like I could move there's orders that you give like once you've decided on the brigade to activate you give an order there's fire you can move um, you can defend and each one has different benefits and allows you to do different things like if you give a unit a defend order they can't move very far they get a minimum move which is you can move one hex out in the open let's just move one hex or you can move two hexes along a major road that's what minimum move is so if you're on defense you get minimum move if you attack you get a positive shift modifier of one because that means your folks are steady and they're aiming they're not moving and walking um, also they get a uh, oh they get they get to rally there might be something else I'm going off memory but each order has benefits like why would I use that order 
On a defend, you can move into assault if you needed to. Now in attack order, you get five movement points for infantry. They can, uh, again, move towards the opponent. They can participate in an assault. They can shoot, but they don't get the positive shift modifier because they're in a moving kind of order. Maybe they're moving an attack column or something. So they still get to attack. There's no penalty, but they don't get the one shift positive modifier. So in a way, there's a built-in penalty for moving and firing. Uh, there's also the move order, which gives you eight movement points, but you can't move within two hexes of the enemy. You have to skirt around them. And uh, let's see here, maneuver. Again, just going off memory, but it has some things with it, like it can't rally. So I think only defend allows you to make a, a rally attempt. That's a big one with defend is lets you take off shaken and roll to see if you can reconstitute a battle-worn unit, bring their morale back up. Uh, so you do your order and you execute the order. Now, I'll just briefly go over fire combat. I got a whole tutorial on that which if you go look on the Kickstarter page, you'll see the tutorial. Fire combat is so, once we got the hang of it, it, it really is easy. Uh, basically, let's just say in this situation, we just looked at our, I should have infantry. It's, with cannon, it's gonna be canister range and whatnot. And that's fine for a little sample here, but, but let's say I've got um, this infantry and they're gonna shoot up here at this cannon. Woo, cannon all by themselves. So you look at your strength points. If uh, you're only a maximum of 10 strength points can fire out of a hex, so this is great. He's 10. You then look for any shift, column shift modifiers. We'll say in this example, there's none. None. No, no, just to keep it simple, none. So what you do is you take three dice. This part at me seemed maybe a little, um, like a lot of steps involved, but it plays really quick, actually. So I know I'm gonna roll on this 10 column. I roll my three dice, roll them off camera a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna say the blues is the one, the blue die is the ones. So they read like a percentile, so 25. I look here at the 25 column, I go all the way across to the 10, well, I guess the 25 row, go to the 10 column, it has a, a green E, okay? I take that down here. I take this cohesion uh, die roll, that three, add it to the target's cohesion rating. So that gives a six. Six, I look at my chart, cross-reference with the E down here, and it says no effect. Let me just say, this is, I'll stop in the mechanics there. You can go watch my tutorial video if you want to see specifically more how this works out. This right here is amazing. This gives so much granularity to combat that it is great. It's not just a matter of, okay, I hit you, flip the unit over, it's now wounded. This gives you so many opportunities to show Maybe they didn't take damage. Like you see here, it just worked out that that hit a sweet spot of no effect, even though I hit the unit. Hey, good luck was with them. The shells landed near them, but nobody got hurt. Or it could be shaken. And a lot of these have two results. In parentheses, you get to decide if that's what you want to do. So like you have to do the item on the left, but then if you want to do the item in parentheses, you can. If there's a slash, you choose to do either the left or you can do the right option. And so with that combination of things, this gives you some real good tactical decisions. So for example, this says in parentheses shake, well, it says shaken and in parentheses has SK, which is skedaddle. That means my unit gets hit they get a shaken marker put on them. That in itself isn't too bad, but if you accumulate shaken markers, you take damage. So you really don't want them. Plus it gives you minus one to your strength points and your cohesion rating. So because this guy just, well, I think I sh in my sample I shot the artillery, but let, let's say the artillery, this guy here was shot because that's where I ended up putting the marker. 
Um, so this unit now has to decide, okay, we just got shot, we're now shaken, but I have the option to skedaddle. Am I really concerned right now? I think I'm feeling pretty lucky. I don't want to skedaddle, but let's say this. The unit already is on its depleted side, so it already has a shaken marker. We just got a shaken marker put on it, and it's on the depleted side. If it gets another shaken marker in this state, that's very bad news for the unit. So now, that optional skedaddle I could take, yeah, I think we'll go ahead and take that skedaddle too that we got. It was an option, but I'm going to skedaddle out of there. So these guys break and run. They're not really broken, but I'm just, you know, imagining like, oh, they just say, I'm out of here. And that's what this gives you. Not everything is an option. Some things like here, there's shaken or skedaddle. Well, let's say this unit, fresh of units, and it gets a shaken or skedaddle. I think, you know, you know what? I don't want them to get shaken. I'll go ahead and skedaddle. Boop. Done. I might look at it and go, you know what? I really want to keep that unit engaged. I'll go ahead and take the shaken and we'll stay put. Now these two are engaged in combat. Brilliant. Love the options on it. Then we did assault combat. Assault combat isn't any more difficult, really. It's pretty simple too. In fact, I really liked it once we once we started doing it. I was like, man, I want to do more assault. Uh, assault combat really kind of starts out the same way. You tally up the strength points in the hex. So does your opponent. See, what's cool about the assault combat is you and your opponent are rolling dice and fighting each other. Then you look at all the modifiers. I'm not going to go over every single modifier. They're in the rule book. But essentially, you do the same thing. You add up your strength point. You find out the starting column that you're on. You apply any shifts that you have. And then you roll your dice. So let's say the Confederate player, in this case, is assaulting this cannon. So the Confederate player is the assaulter, so he'll roll first. He rolls a 23. Now you don't need the red die for this one yet. So you just go 23. I look at my calm, I come over here to the 10, look up 23, and it's like a green. All right, so down here, the attacker CRT result is green. So keep that in mind. Now the Union player does the same thing. Tallies up his six applies any of the column shift modifiers he might have, rolls, he rolls a 12. He roll, goes 12, onto a four is a no effect. So now we come down here, defender looks at this side, attacker looks here, and you cross-reference. So the defender, as no effect, goes over here to, what we say, red. I'll pretend it was red. And it says defender gets shaken result and has to skedaddle too. Brilliant, because on the converse, if one player, if the defender outrolls the attacker, there's a chance that depending on where it lands on the chart, the attacker takes some damage. And we found that the results usually kind of brought us to where the defender usually took a, a damage, but it really could go either way based on how you line up your assaults. Again, simply brilliant chart and design. Real, I picked it up right away. I thought it was great. My buddy, we had to go over a few times exactly when the or applies or when you do both or, you know, but I think that if we played some more, it would make sense. I, I get If I can get it, anybody can get this. But it's really simplistic to run all your combat pretty much off this one chart. It's really cool. There was one thing we had to pull up on another chart, which was right here. Close fight. So there's a chance that in the close assault, the two opposing folks, their dice results equal something called a close fight, meaning it's too close to call. It could go either towards the Union or either towards the Confederate player. It's too close to call. So in that case, this is when each of you grab your red die and you roll them together. 
right? You each roll your dice separately, but you add the results together. So we just roll them. The union player rolled a four, confederate player rolled a five. You then hop on over to this chart right here. Close fight resolution table. We got a combined five, it says concealed defense. If the defending hex has any orchard graphic, or if the assault hex is an angled or dry stream hex, apply shaken and skedaddle result on the attacker. If not, apply only one skedaddle result on the attacking unit. So just based on how the combat went, you rolled, it was too close to call who it went to, you have the tiebreaker die roll, roll and then it tells you what happened it's great it's not that complicated super love it after you do combat let's say combat was your thing or you maneuvered whatever it was you did that was your activation card your activation phase all your steps are done then it comes to the end of the turn. You decide which cards you want to hold on to. Well, it says hold event card step. Okay, so this is saying like if you had any hold cards that you didn't play, if the text was still eligible, you and the Confederate player would alternate playing them. The one thing I didn't see in the rule book was what then? I guess you play them for the default event. So I think the idea is you get rid of all your cards. No cards carry over from turn to turn. So I think that's what my buddy and I did is either I think we either just discarded them or we went ahead and played them for the default event. I don't remember now, but um, that part I wasn't too clear on. But eventually you're going to get rid of the cards in your hand. And then you check for victory contentions. And if this isn't the last turn of the game, you move on to the next one. So quite honestly, I think the first turn that we played probably took the half hour to an hour to kind of figure out what we were doing. And after that, it sped up each time. It got faster and faster. So probably once you and your buddy know how to play, I probably explain things a little more in depth as if I was telling like a person who's never played before. But I think that the sequence of play goes pretty quick. I think you could play a larger scenario pretty quickly. I know they say that there's like the 12 to 13 hours for the entire Gettysburg campaign that uses the whole map, but I think Herman Lutman said, you know, that might be true for people who are kind of new, um, but I really feel like the game speeds along pretty well once you get a hang for things. So with that in mind, I think we'll just kind of end there. I mean, like I said, I was just going to talk and talk and talk about this. We're coming up on 50 minutes. If you watched this video all the way through, trying to learn about the game, great. Kudos to you. I have a little video that is, I don't know how long it is. I'm going to edit it up and then post it, but it's a one turn of gameplay after we kind of got a hang for things. We forgot to do the preliminary bombardment. That otherwise I think we hit everything else. We even did assault combat to try it out. Uh, we didn't do all the dice rolling for some stuff. It was hard to learn the game and then film something you didn't know how to do and then you put it on camera. So it doesn't maybe show the mechanics all the way through, but you do see like the ending results of assault and, and whatnot. But uh, I would say once you get the hang of the game, it's fantastic. If you've got experience playing like The Devil's to Pay, which this is kind of a, a continuation of, I think you'll enjoy this one so much better. If you're a person who really doesn't like random uh, unit activation, you know, I want to say that you probably would still like this one, but, you know, I know some folks like a little more structured and... I don't know, I would say that this one probably would still work for you because the reason why I think this one would still work is when you look at the scenarios, the scenarios have very, very set up, you know, where the units are. And I'm looking at the reinforcement schedules here. Let's see who's got a good reinforcement. Reinforcement schedules. 
So this this goes historically. I can only assume it goes historically accurate when troops arrive. Four o'clock. Here's where Neb and Eustace Shaler arrive. Five o'clock. All of these guys. Six o'clock. You know, all of these divisions start coming on and they're following on brigades. And then the cards. What they do is they give you that option to, like that's where you come in as the commander. We already know historically when these different men arrived with their, their soldiers, but what it needs from you now is how to organize when they become active in that turn. You know, once they're arrived in the game, we're going to assume that at some point, almost all those core will activate at some degree in a turn. So your job as the commander is how to use those troops that are activated, and that, those random cards give that to you, that chance to manage the chaos that ensues. I I would recommend it. I really do. I think this is good. Uh, but again, like any game, you're going to have to decide for yourself if that is for you. But I would say, again, if you like uh, Civil War games, and you like Herman Lutman design, and you like Rick Barber maps, I think this is a great purchase because the game is really, really good. And I hope that me just talking through it gives you a better understanding of, of some of the game mechanics and how the game will play out for you. And if you have any questions, ask. I'll see what I can answer because, again, um, I'm going to have to send out this copy and then all I'll have left of it is the rule book that's on the Internet. So if you want to go check out the rules, go to flyingpiggames.com. Look for A Most Fearful Sacrifice, and there's a link to the rules on the webpage, so you can check out the rules for yourself now, and, you know, read up on it, and probably just from my explanation, you can say, wait, you did this wrong. Well, yeah, probably, but that's how I learn. Anyway, again, thank you so much for watching. Leave comments below, and I will talk to you next time.